American Society of Public Administration section on science and government and technology and science and technology and government's uh, lunch and learn in our second one for 2024. I am Georgette Dumont. I am the MPA director and associate professor at the University of North Florida. We are so happy that you're able to join us today for what's going to be a very interesting discussion and as well as timely, good old AI. This meeting is being recorded and will be posted to our YouTube channel later today. Before I start, I'd like to let you know a little bit about STIG, ASPIS, Science, Tech, ASPIS Section on Science and Technology and Government. The mission of STIG is to assist public administrators to learn more about the uses and limitations of science and technology in government. By promoting awareness of government's use of science and technology, STIG's goal is to improve government efficiency and effectiveness. STIG members are interested in a broad array of topics from environmental sciences to artificial intelligence to science innovation policies and everything in between. These are dynamic and exciting subjects matters which government continues to grapple with and needs researchers and practitioners to explore. If you want more information about STIG, you can go to our website at sstig.info. In order to ensure a timely event, questions will be addressed at the end of the discussion. Please use the Q&A feature if you'd like to submit a question prior to the end, or if you'd wish to ask your question directly, please use the raise hand function in Zoom and you will be called on as time allows. With that said, I'd like to turn this webinar over to our very own STIG chair, Sukumar Ganapati. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia. Thank you for that introduction. And thank you, especially Marianne Jansen and Ricardo Bezier-Yates for joining us on this uh, STIG webinar. To give a little background of uh, where we are in this discussion, uh, we had, as Georgette mentioned, one webinar last month where we had representatives from state and local governments having this conversation on AI policy and how state and local governments are looking at this. So for this one, we thought we'll turn to the actual core part of AI, looking at this both from a research and implementation perspective on what responsible AI is. And for this, we have two very interesting speakers, Dr. Marianne Jansen, who is a full professor of ICT and governance at Delft in Netherlands. Hello, Marijn. Hello. Glad to you. Thank you. And we also have Dr. Ricardo Beza Yates, who is also uh, from uh, the Responsible AI. He's the director of research at the Institute for Experiential AI at Northeastern University and it's based in Silicon Valley. Hello, Ricardo. Hello, thank you for the invitation, although I'm connected from uh, Barcelona, so same time of Marine. I imagine you're traveling. Yes. <laughs> so wonderful to have both of you here. And I wanted to start with this larger picture of uh, how quickly AI has been evolving and there have been a number of questions about uh, what responsible AI is and what AI should be doing. So I wanted to set the base first with Marine. Uh, what you see as uh, the responsible AI and how that's evolving in uh, the EU context. Yeah, thank you for this uh, question. It's a very difficult uh, question to answer, of course, but that's why we're here. And from the Faculty of Technology, Policy and Management. So well, how I view AI is very simple. I view AI as one of the system components that fits in the broader socio-technical uh, system. So it's one of the things that are changing. 
But you know, when you're changing one element, also the all other elements are changing. So also the data is changing that is needed. Eh? Mm -hmm. Also the people are, are changing. Mm -hmm. So I would view responsible AI as something that is changing the whole system. And what's very important for that is uh, public values. We often take a look at public values. And in the uh, EU context, we often talk about trustworthy AI. And a trustworthy AI contains a whole range of different values like transparency, accountability, privacy, and so on. So it's about adhering to those kinds of values. And personally, I don't think we are there yet for responsible uh, AI, because that would assume that we have AI that fits all those values. But I think we're still in the area that there's a large technology push and we have a tool uh, for that. We're pushing it. We are learning uh, from it. But also the impact is unclear. So we don't know which values are affected. So we had a whole discussion about generative AI and the role of privacy. Yeah? What happens if you're asking questions and you have your sensitive data? Well, then you give away your data and you have a problem with the general data project uh, regulation in uh, Europe for that. So that may all, means also when you want to experiment with uh, generative AI, then you need to have your own installations or ensure that uh, it won't run away with your data in one way or other. And that's also what at this moment responsible AI is about. It's changing all the time. And we have a lack of understanding of what it can do. We are trying to use it. We are already using a lot of AI, but still it's developing all the time. And it takes many forms and shapes, and we don't know the impact that well. And then we have a very important topic, explainable uh, AI. But yeah, I don't think explainable AI is that well developed yet. We talk about it and uh, we keep it uh, simple, but we are searching uh, for ways to get explainability uh, to it. But explainability, I think, is very important for responsible AI. Just a short overview, because I think we can talk forever about this question. That's a great introduction. Um, Ricardo, how do you view the uh, rapid evolution of AI, and especially with responsible AI. You'll have to unmute, Carlos. Sorry. Um, first, I would like to mention what is not responsible AI for me, and that's why we, we use that word. And, and it's interesting that Marion Marian said uh, trustworthy AI. I don't like trustworthy AI. Because we know that the technology doesn't work all the time, so I don't think it's correct to, to put the burden on the user that they need to trust the technology. That's why I believe we need to be responsible. The technology is not yet there. Uh, for example, the typical example I put it, even if you go to an elevator that says it works 99% of the time, you are not safe, so you will not take it. Now, if you say that the elevator will not work 1% of the time, and when it doesn't work, it stops, then I will take it because I know it's safe, although it's not very good engineering because it's failing uh, still 1% of the time. But that's the difference today between AI uh, and engineering. In AI, we are only evaluating success, while in engineering, we evaluate failure. And I think that we need, that's something we need to change in the future to make a really AI responsible. So look at the harm and the risk, uh, and then how to mitigate that in advance, not, not when we have the problems like today. Now for me, uh, and I agree, uh, and then in the second part, we need to uh, have some values uh, that, that this software should, should, should uh, not, not, not the same software to fulfill because software is not a human being, but basically the people doing this software should basically follow these uh, different uh, uh, values. I like uh, the ones that we devised at the ACM. So uh, one, of, one, of, one of the two main authors of this uh, set of responsible uh, basically the, the principles for responsible remix systems. There are nine, so I will read it very fast. So the, the first one is, uh, I push for this one, which is one that I should, we should use more, so legitimacy and competence. So basically show that your system is legitimized for society. And also you have all the competence to do it, including the administrative competence, because many problems are because you do things that you shouldn't do, you don't have permission to do. Then you need to, you need to minimize harm. 
and to make sure that people don't look only at human harm. We also have another one that's limiting environmental impacts because harm should be not only to humans, but also to the planet. And then we have more classical, uh, classical principles like security and privacy, transparency, uh, interpretability and explanation. So that's related to explainable AI, maintainability, basically to keep the system as intended. And then we have the two that, that are because of uh, troubles like contestability and auditability. You have a problem and someone needs to contest and then audit the system. And finally, the one that is about responsibility, so accountability and responsibility. So these are the, the nine principles. Some, some of them have two, so in reality it's a bit more like 14 principles, but this covers all possible things. Now, we did this in October 22, just before uh, uh, the first uh, blueprint from the US. And one week later, ChatGPT appears. So we had to extend these principles for generative AI last year. And the extensions are related to, for example, uh, copyright, uh, the control of your data, and everything that we have seen uh, because of, of uh, the new problems that generative AI, uh, disinformation and so on appear. So, so there are other like five more principles that appear with generative AI that complement these principles. So that, that's for me responsibility, this overall view from when you have the idea to when you need to be responsible because you didn't do it right. That's a, that's a very good base to start from, given uh, how the responsible AI and AI in general is evolving. What do you see as the main kind of openings or the kind of upside of how AI is evolving? And what do you see as the main kind of downside of uh, where the responsibility is not happening? Let me start with uh, Mariah and you again. And the downsides, yeah, that's that's also a very broad question. Eh? We, we often <laughs> tend to focus on the upside. Eh? We look at from, oh, it will break on more productivity. Eh? Oh, it will become more efficient. Oh, we can make all kinds of new uh, applications for it. Oh, it brings all kinds of new uh, opportunities. And well, as I said at the introduction from, wow, often we don't understand the impact. And when you start understanding the impact, often the downsides appears. Eh? And the downsides appears from, oh, yeah, the information, uh, the outcomes, the results are not correct. Yeah, well, we know that AI is never completely accurate. Uh, eh? From how are you going to deal uh, with that? We know then there's a bias in it. Eh? We have simple uh, research over here that analyzes uh, the bias in AI. And simple speakers already have bias because they are trained on uh, certain voices and certain languages are or dialects are, are not easy to understand. And then we, we look at easily to see uh, results from it, but often they're also not that easy to uh, see uh, results. And that might result in discrimination. And you might know uh, that uh, the country where I'm from, coming from had some uh, incidents with uh, what could we say AI driven because they used large scale uh, data that resulted into wrong decisions that were later contested. Yeah, it's hard to contest AI, yeah, by the way. Yeah, that's one of the downsides yeah, because people think also that AI is always right. Yeah? How can the computer be wrong? Yeah? Computer says no, yeah? that means the computer is right. Yeah? No, you should be contest the computer, the outcomes of uh, uh, it. And I think that's also about responsible uh, AI. You should be able to complain about it. We can complain about human beings if we are not happy. Where can I explain to which manager when uh, the AI is not working uh, in a proper and responsible uh, way? So responsible AI requires a lot of also uh, governance controls in it and to understand both the upsides, which is really, yeah, because that's all what we often focus on, yeah, that results in the technology push. There's nothing wrong with a technology push, but you should also look at the downsides about the problems that it can encounter. And the problem with AI is often that we don't see the problems or we only discover them later in the process. There was something wrong. Oh, after a couple of months, we discover it uh, only when we're too late or it's massive. 
that if something goes wrong, that you make millions of uh, failures uh, in it. And if it's massive, you really have a problem with that. That means also you have to build in, in your whole system robustness. With systems, I mean organizations also. Uh, you have to ensure that you have organization measures for uh, dealing uh, with, uh, with that. And you need to balance it. Huh? I'm Professor Einstein, governance, we know governance is about looking at the benefit, looking at the risk and balancing yeah. it a little bit. But now we look too much about the benefits, too limited about the risk and the problems uh, it causes, and it not really risk because it happens. It's even more than that. Huh? It happens so. Those are problems. And then the problems should be solved and only then use it. But there are also examples from how it can be done. But you have to take it uh, with uh, with care. And um, I would say from uh, ensure, if you would do it in a responsible AI uh, way, that you have the countermeasures that people will assess and audit the AI before you bring it in a live uh, environment. That will be critical and also look at what are the possible negative consequences or that might be appear. We also know from a couple of days ago that chat GPT started talking nonsense eh? for a couple of uh, hours uh, for that. That's happened, yeah. You need to really to look at it and take care of it. Those kind of things that can happen. That's uh, for now my uh, little overview view. And the human side of the, uh, of AI, uh, Ricardo? Yeah, so so there are many upsides, and I think that the hype doesn't help to see the right ones because the, then people overestimate the value of AI. So I, I will not talk much about that because the, there's already a bias in the system to talk about the good things we can do. But I guess I would like to say that that if we have uh, if we think on, on the society first and not on money, and then things can be much better. For example. Uh, one thing I, I say is that if anything you do is to empower people instead of replacing people, we will have many less problems than we have today. Because when you are thinking on on how to improve productivity or the lives of people and not how to replace them. Now, the, the already um, Marin mentioned, for example, discrimination, which is the main problem. And, and I guess you were alluding to the city, the city case in, in Netherlands, which is the largest political impact of a of a badly designed system. Not sure if it's AI because it's never been public how much AI the system had, but it doesn't matter. This is a problem we can discuss later that, that uh, for example, the principles are mentioned are for any algorithmic system, not only from AI, because you can do bad systems that are not AI too. And we have done that. Maybe the most uh, recent case is the one that was happened last January in the, in the UK, where finally a case similar to Siri that was uh, from the post office was known after like 20 years of how it impacted the life of 900 people, even for committed suicide because of wrong accusations of an accounting system, which is not AI, but still was a wrong system. So to, to add to the downside that the Marine already mentioned, I would, I would like to add uh, pseudoscience. I think there are many uh, assumptions that are not true, like for example, using data of other people to uh, predict behavior of, of me, for example, if there's no data about me, really there's no science behind behind that. Or, or things like uh, people using your face to the, to know your sexual orientation, your political orientation, or, or other things that really don't don't work. Now we have all the all the problems with uh, generative AI today. That includes uh, also before, but now includes more the basically the environmental impact. The basically the use of natural resources for training and also for inferring uh, text at the massive scale. Now there are more than one billion people is using uh, these chatbots every day. Uh, on the on, but on the other hand, I want to be fair. I think TikTok may be worse, but no one is looking at TikTok because uh, at least some people is using ChatGPT to work. Uh, other people is just procrastinating. And then I, I guess. Uh, especially this year that we have more than 70 countries with elections, this information will be uh, the, the year of this information, sadly, of deep fakes. And we already have seen a, a basically the last deep fake uh, that happened in Hong Kong with video. So we have seen that anything is possible and, and even 
the same people cannot realize that they're seeing a deep fake from them because it's very hard. And then the last one that really worries me and we're just seeing the beginning is, is mental health. Basically how we uh, humanize these technologies and people believe that they are talking to uh, machines that are sentient or conscious or even uh, that they are really seeing when, when they are just imitating us. But the imitation is so good that people believe that this is like magic and, and really there is a person on the other side. And I guess the worst case of that one happened very close to Marion in Belgium when a person committed suicide after talking six weeks with a chatbot. So we need to look at this because this is just the beginning of, of the problems and, and we, we need to stop them soon. Well, I, I do understand the problems that come out of uh, the platforms like ChatGPT and others uh, and uh, how there could be issues and bias and so forth. But that's one of the arguments that... Uh, the good information is going to drive out the bad information. So over time, the platforms are going to get better. So the platforms themselves can monitor what's going on within their uh, system. And each of those platforms have their own kind of responsible AI statements, right? Google has its own, Microsoft has its uh, own and so forth. So there's going to be a reputational effect of these platforms by right, which we will use, which could potentially drive out the bad information and keep the good information. So uh, if the platforms can monitor themselves, then do we need any kind of broader social or government policy? Or do you believe that platforms can indeed monitor themselves in that sense? And what would be the role of uh, public policy in that kind of a context then? Let me come back to uh, Marianne. Wow. Platforms that can monitor and look at their own information and then look if it's correct or not. That assumes that we can know what information is correct. Sometimes it's very easy to know if some information is correct, eh? somebody a uh, birth date or something like that. But often information is much more fuzzier. That's also the example Ricardo gave uh, about the Netherlands. From it's not that easy. If somebody has a social problem, there's a lot of data about it, and well, you can generalize it or whatever. But not data does not capture it all. You can't see it all. Furthermore, you don't know how to interpret it from uh, if it means good or not uh, with that. So it's quite hard to it. And if you look at the examples, for example, we have fact checkers. And sometimes the fact checker, checkers, we have multiple of them, say different things. One say, yeah, it's fact. The other one say, no, it's nonsense. Same thing about it. So it's a little bit idealistic, I think, to think that we are able to screen out what is good or uh, what is bad with that, because there will be a complete gray zone. And the, the gray zone can also be because it's a certain view on it, a political view on it, uh, reframing things in a different uh, way and those, those kinds of things. So that's quite difficult also. I did much research in dashboards and all, already the interpretation of dashboards is very difficult. There's a lot of information in it. It's fueled with that. And then we look at it and we don't really know what to steer with it and we can do it. So yes, in the ideal situation, we might come to it that the platforms are able to uh, uh, know what's correct data and uh, uh, filter it out. But I think we are very far, far away uh, from it. And then even we uh, we still have time uh, for not uh, using it. Yeah, yeah. It, what should be the main policy focus of governments? Maybe not using AI. Did people think about uh, that? Huh? It's of course the complete reverse uh, world, but people often don't think about it. Mm -hmm. So don't take jumping on the bandwagon as a starting point, but take what you want to address as a starting point. 
because it could be generated. If AI more fake news can be uh, generated, that means also you have to have more fact check checkers and those kinds of things. Well, it's a whole fuzzy landscape. And as a normal citizen, you don't know anymore what's going on. You don't have any clue about it. And one is saying this and the other was saying that. So it's completely uh, uh, unclear for that. And then there's... Uh, uh, an item that's very important for that, and that's uh, responsible AI is transformative. So it will change the way we work, the way our work pro processes, the way the type of public services we have, the way we process information, also participation um, uh, is changing with that. So it's transformative. So what we are doing, and that's why sometimes people saying it's like industrialization uh, area of so we're changing. We're changing the society. Uh, also, our public values might uh, change over that. And that might be an important uh, area for policymakers, for responsible uh, AI. How is it transformative? And how can we support that transformative? And don't do it too fast, because that's why I started. It's a little bit a joke, but it's also serious. Just don't use AI. Just don't do it. Do it. Why do you want to use uh, something that might... Uh, fire back on you or uh, have uh, possible negative uh, consequences. And I had a situation uh, with that, that we started looking and the idea was to use an AI tool. And then we started analyzing it. And then we found out we can do this with a very simple statistical uh, way of looking at the data that immediately is also explainable because I can look at the data uh, sources. So you don't, sometimes you don't need a very heavy tool because I AI is really a very high, heavy tool, what you often use. Sometimes you can do it with uh, simple uh, tools uh, for that. From the other hand, it's progressing. And that means also you have to look at the possibilities. So you need also to stimulate use in all kinds of uh, uh, areas. And when you look at what's happening, and then I like really what you're uh, saying about uh, getting the, uh, the, 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 the wrong data, incorrect data out of it. You need data governance. And I don't think that uh, AI can do the job, but you can start with the items that are very factual. There you can get it out. If somebody is 180 years old in your system, well, it's likely that your system is not correct. Huh? Those kind of uh, things with that. So you can use also AI for quality, data quality assessment, looking for weird patterns that might not be uh, correct and uh, improving uh, the data uh, quality. Uh, also, you can use people also for that. If you, you start using AI, ensure that you use your citizens, that you use also your professionals for doing it. The more eyes you have, eh, the more, the better you are able to uh, look at the problems and find uh, the, the problems. So ensure that you have a lot of eyes to look at the uh, problems. I would also recommend to ensure that in your policy uh, making, those kinds of things. And some of them are required by the European uh, AI Act. Eh? They require, for example, uh, that there are mechanisms for uh, filing in complaints and some kind of uh, control mechanism and that you do a risk assessment and those kinds of things uh, uh, for that. Some are already required by uh, uh, law or legislation or different kinds of legislation, but you can do much more than that. Ricardo, same point. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Platform regulate themselves. Uh, no, I agree with Marin. I mean, like uh, the you know, currently the technology is predicting words and prediction predicting doesn't mean that they know the truth. They don't know when they are true or false. They don't even confidence. Even if you have a confidence value, you really don't know uh, if it's something true or false. And and. And it's not only because we don't have knowledge bases where we can fact check some 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 facts. It's because, as also Marion mentioned, we have different types of facts. For example, there are some that maybe there's multiple views and we disagree. And this is a problem today that really worries me because we uh, basically we are colonizing with American culture in the whole world because everything is translated to English and then sent back in the original language. We also have a huge uh, increase on the digital divide because that is only done in 85 languages and we have more than 7,000 that are still alive on earth. But that's another topic that uh, is also a problem. 
Uh, but then you have the, the facts that uh, are known by many few people. So facts that are really experts or even facts that are personal. For example, um, I use this in my talk because uh, in, in, in February, someone asked a question in Brazil and, and I, I appear in, the, in a list of dead people. So the system believed I was dead. Of mm -hmm. course, in the next version, ChatGPT 4 I was alive again, that was good. But basically, the, the data there is something that only someone very close to me will know if it's true or not. And people, because of confirmation bias, will believe in these things. And then uh, the, the system also has a confirmation bias because anything you ask, the system will try to, to do it, even, even if it doesn't exist. And, and recently, we, we, were, we were discussing with one of my researchers that he was finishing a proposal and said, can you give me three references for this kind of work? And he invented three papers. One was mine with almost the same title. I said, oh, I should write that paper because uh, to, to make it right. And also we'll compete with your proposal because it's exactly what you're writing. <laughs> and the other two papers were also from people that we know. And of course the paper didn't exist. So anytime you ask, the system will have this confirmation of bias of I have to tell you, I have to tell this human what, he or she wants. Doesn't matter if it exists or not. It's creativity, some people say. But in some context, that's interesting if you're writing a novel. But in the context of research, it's not interesting. It's really even dangerous. So we have all these subtleties that we need to understand what we are doing with this system. And, and maybe I'm not so, so harsh, uh, like Marian saying, not to use AI. But I would say not to use AI for this kind of task, for example. If it's something professional, and we already have lawyers with problem because of using ChatGPT in the US uh, and inventing cases that then the judge found out and they, they, they basically punish the lawyers for being so stupid, we should say, okay, if we cannot check something, don't use it. For news, don't use it. For justice, don't use it. For education, don't use it. Uh, to, to write a novel and you don't want to have a white page, okay, use it. To, to summarize things, use it. To find facts in text, so extract entities, use it. So they are safe uses and they are bad uses and we need to distinguish them. Uh, the, one of the problems that suddenly we are doing the alpha testing for, for, for all these models uh, because they, were, they first they, they, they were not evaluated completely and second, uh, it's open domain. So it's impossible to evaluate. Like you can ask anything you want in the way that you want, uh, and we have whatever the system will generate because can generate anything you want too. So, so there's no limits. It's infinitely many uh, possibilities. So, Ricardo, uh, what do you see the role of public policy then? Uh, do we need oh, yeah. any kind of outside policy? I believe I, I believe public policy is very important. So, for example, I mentioned the principles of ICM and and and. And there are other associations and, and bodies that are doing policy. Uh, these are uh, right now the recommendations. They are not uh, legislation. Uh, the only one that is so currently in place and it's very interesting is the regulation of China on generative AI that started last June in China. It's quite complete. Uh, and one reason is that uh, they realize that uh, this information is a problem for any kind of uh, political regime, not only for democracies, like Harari was saying last July in The Economist. Uh, if you put enough disinformation in the system, doesn't matter if you are an autocracy or, or a democracy, this will be a problem. So they put this in place and they have very harsh measures if you don't uh, basically abide on this regulation. For example, disinformation is penalized a lot. I wish we, 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 should, we, we could do something similar because I think this is the main problem this year disinformation, and we already say, say, seen uh, cases of disinformation that are really worrisome because you can have any person saying whatever you want in the right voice and the right face. Uh, so I think we need to, to do that. Sadly, the EU AI Act, even if it's voted by the parliament next month, will not be in place until 2026. So it's too late for uh, this year. So we need to do something, but I don't know if uh, the political system can do so something fast because this technology is going too fast. Um, another way would be, okay, let's slow down and think about the impact, but uh, also that will not happen. 
So a quick question to both of you before I open up uh, the conversation. Do you see any kind of model uh, policies out there? Uh, I know Ricardo, you mentioned the China Act and Marianne, you mentioned part on the EU uh, that you see would be uh, responsive to the responsible AI, how it's evolving. Uh, Marianne? Yeah, I think this is also a, a moving target. Eh? Like Ricardo was saying, it's so fast moving that you can't keep mm -hmm. up with it. So it's also a challenge uh, for that when you want to regulate it. From You have also to look at what you allow, what you will uh, not allow. And when you have a really responsible AI, you need responsible uh, companies. You need uh, responsible people if they adhere to it, but you know it's not going to work eh? because 90% uh, might behave responsible, but there's always a small part in society who, uh, uh, who doesn't behave in that way and look for uh, getting, uh, getting uh, uh, profits from it. So mm -hmm. what's important is the, the human control component that we can still manage it. Uh, what's important sandboxes that you can experiment in your sandboxes, uh, look uh, at it. Uh, important is that you know the impact, you also know the ethics uh, uh, surrounding, and the, I would expect that the normative nature becomes uh, more important. Eh? We, we, we talked about uh, what uh, what is correct or not. Well, partly some some normative parts can be included in AI. Eh? We, we focused a lot of data-driven AI nowadays in the last practical application, but we have also normative AI where you have also your norms and your deviations from it, which is a completely other stream of AI. But then they might be integrated in the type of things uh, uh, we do uh, now, and that will uh, move it forward. So I think that a AI, responsible AI and AI technology will become more advanced. We will uh, integrate all kinds of new things in it. This is just the beginning. Later, we will uh, smile about it. How can we make this type of mistakes or something like that? How how could we allow that huh? 10 years from now or 20 years uh, from now? That's what I would uh, expect. But you can only know it afterwards huh? and when you do it. And we don't know what we're heading for. And there's so many uh, options in the technology that can be added. Huh? When you look at the plugs in for... Um, uh, chat GPT uh, to add explainability to it to have all kinds of advances because people see the opportunities uh, uh, for that and we should also grasp that but we should also not block them uh, a little bit and yeah sometimes you might do something wrong and we should ensure that uh, it will not have a large effect uh, uh, on it yeah ensure that we sure. not become the wild wild west I would say <laughs> So, Ricardo, any... Yeah, so it's a, it's a very hard question. I don't think I can add much more, but but I felt when when ChatGPT appeared, that was in November 30, 2022, was like, it, like opening a Pandora box, mm -hmm. like opening a, a lot of problems that we uh, we didn't know. So we need to discover that because in, in the classical Pandora box, at least we knew what was getting out. Uh, here, we didn't know. Uh, and I hope, also hope, uh, it was there, but I don't know because it's not the classical Pandora box. But now with Sora, for example, this is already uh, announced, but it's not yet uh, uh, available. So we already experimented with one and a half year with text, and now we'll go to video. And we, before mm -hmm. we had this, but imagine it's, it's more, more innocuous, so, so like a, it's much harder to, apart from this information, it's much harder to, to harm society with just images. But video, video is so harmful. Like, like you have people speaking, saying things, and people will believe it if, if, if are their beliefs and so on. So I, I, I think that that will be the next Pandora box and it's getting bigger and other problems will get out, which we don't know. Um, for example, there is already people talking to dead people. And, and near relatives, so so which is not so healthy either. So that's also another factor of the mental health problem that I mentioned before. So so we need to regulate these things. For example, you cannot uh, recreate a person that uh, was born uh, less than hundred years ago to say something. 
very simple things like like trying to limit the the creative uses of people to do things that are not good for their their uh, either mental health or their even physical health. Uh, because basically what happened in Belgium reminds me the the movie Hair. So the, all this has been in science fiction, uh, and even science fiction seems to have to be to have more happy endings than 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 real life. And as as many people will say, uh, real life sometimes is more surprising than than fiction. So so I, I we need to regulate. We need to do something simple. I think that the, the solution is not regulating the use of technology. Uh, the, the solution is to maybe extend human rights in a way that, that applies to any technology. Like, for example, these are the new problems that we didn't have 70 years ago, and how, what things we need to make sure that, that we, we follow uh, to, to have a better world. Now, given this, uh, after how many years? It will be uh, 80 years, almost, of the human rights we still are not able to enforce human rights in all the planet. So, so we already haven't solved the, that problem and we have a new one that is uh, going much faster. So, and it's, our, and it's our fault. I mean, we are developing this technology. So, so it's like, uh, we like to create more problems in, instead of trying to solve the ones that we already have. That's great. So we are having this interesting conversation and let me see if there are any uh, comments, questions, thoughts from our, our attendees. If you do have any thoughts or questions, please go ahead and post and we'll be monitoring it. Uh, um, I don't see any questions so far, right, Georgette? Correct. So uh, you can go ahead and post those questions. Meanwhile, I wanted to also jump in with another uh, thought that is uh, we are in the business of education and teaching and um, mm -hmm. uh, public policy, public administration and so forth. Uh, what do you think uh, we should be um, teaching them about uh, what's happening with responsible AI? Oh, a lot. <laughs> a lot. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. I what? It, okay, AI is transformative, so it also transforms the way we do our teaching, or uh, our the way we do our research uh, for that. So we already have policy from oh yeah, feel free to uh, use AI, but you should mention it, else. Uh, uh, we don't know that you're using it. And then of course you try to have uh, checkers if that people used AI uh, to generate a text or something like that. And well, it's very hard to uh, detect. So it's 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 changing the way our students are, are writing their reports. It's changing the way uh, they try to uh, solve the problems for that. So we should help them with them. And we should be very clear about in education what is allowed, what's not allowed. It's a little bit easier with the regulation because it's it's easier to say what is not allowed because in education the, the, the students should uh, be able eh, to do it themselves. But it's like in the past eh, we had a discussion about Wikipedia. Well, so they uh, use Wikipedia or not? Well, it can be a good starting point uh, we know uh, for now, but you have to be critical because it might not be correct uh, uh, and there might be some... Uh, nonsense in it the same with uh, uh, AI from it might be correct but it might also be wrong so ensure that you're able to detect if it's right or wrong uh, for that and uh, it also helps here yeah, from um, in the past uh, we had sometimes uh, writing uh, by the by, by the students which is completely lousy and nowadays you hardly see that anymore there's so many good tools that will help you uh, to uh, ensure that your uh, grammar is correct, uh, that formulations are correct. And that makes me also happy because as a teacher, it's much easier. And it seems to be that the students are able to use those kinds of uh, tools for the better uh, and uh, to avoid nonsense. And you see less and less nonsense uh, in it, those kinds of tools. So you expect the same uh, thing for uh, 
teaching, education, but also uh, as a public servant, uh, how do you uh, write a letter? Let it generate by AI much faster, much easier. Productivity can go uh, up, but ensure that you read it before you submit it. <laughs> Else you might uh, make uh, huge uh, mistakes or also ensure that maybe somebody else reads it to ensure. And the problem is that uh, if you're operating in such a large area, that you're expected to have expertise in all areas because it's generating so much that you have to see, yeah, this is correct, that is correct, and that's correct. That means also that our students should be broader. They should have deep expertise, but they should have expertise in very different areas because they come uh, together and uh, to able to judge it. And that makes it also uh, hard for doing it. Oh, Ricardo? Yeah, I would like to, I would like to, I think Marion already answered your question quite well. So I would like to answer the question in the chat because I, I mentioned the digital divide. And the, the question is, how do you define the problem and what would be the solutions? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the my definition of the problem basically is, uh, what is the people that doesn't have access to, for example, genetic AI? And, and then we can start with all the people that doesn't have internet, like 35%. All the people that don't speak the language supported by ChatGPT or, or other chatbots, that's about 15%. Of course, there is some overlap. We don't know exactly what is the overlap. But then we have all the people that are too young or too old to use the technology. We are the people that don't have native uh, digital skills and or maybe then don't want to, to have it. Because I think very important, the, what I call my uh, my uh, digital right number zero is the right not to be digital, not to be uh, mm -hmm. connect, uh, to be purely human without any technology. That's the right. So if you take all these these numbers, I would I'm sure we can get like fifty percent of the population. So basically, we have a divide that is fifty percent that doesn't have, doesn't have access to technology or this side of technology. And then 50% that have access to this technology and maybe understands it, um, which is another problem. Do you understand it or not? Are you many being manipulated by it or not? And so on. So, so this is the problem. And now, what are the solutions? Uh, the solutions uh, are the same one that we had before, but I guess now we need to implement them faster. So if people need more internet, internet connectivity, provide that. Uh, there are some changes like uh, things that are, are being done by using uh, satellites that can go to any place in, in the planet. So every time, every day is easier to to have access if you have the money to pay for these services, because there also there is an economical divide involved and an educational divide that also affects this. Uh, but but then we, we will need to do things like, uh, uh, I guess, awareness of the problems. I think Marion also said that in some way. Like we need to be aware of what are the risks and what are the benefits of the technology. And, 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 and that means understand the biases in data, in systems, in the interaction with people with the system, because bias has many sources. And, and also, um, basically, I, I guess we need to understand more the ethics of technology. What is OK? Uh, what is the science? Uh, what can be done? What makes sense? Uh, so. Also, Marian mentioned a risk impact assessment. That should be done all the time, especially if there are other possible issues like environmental impact and not only uh, human harm. So, so we can do maybe, I would say, even like a marketing movement. Uh, if responsible AI will be the new organic food or the new uh, price, uh, just, just price, maybe we can use even marketing to push how to do it right. It's a pity that many of the things that are better for us uh, at the end need to be marketing to become something uh, trendy. Because uh, if they are better for us, we shouldn't need any marketing to do it. But we are very strange animals where, where laziness, procrastination, mediocrity needs to be fought to, to be better. That's excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't see any additional questions uh, on the chat, but I wanted to wrap up with uh, uh, what you think is, uh, you know, if you were to put the crystal ball ahead of you and see what's happening, in the, not in the next five years, but the next three years. And Ricardo, you mentioned uh, 
the whole video that's evolving very quickly. Um, what else do you see, Ricardo? Well, um, it's interesting you put the example of a, of a crystal ball because in some sense, uh, AI is a crystal ball. It's predicting the future, although it's predicting in many different ways. Today was a very interesting uh, uh, presentation by Helga Novotny, a former uh, director of the ERC program in Europe, which is an amazing sociologist, uh, more than 80 years old, but is still amazingly lucid. And, and, and part of the, the idea was, was these unknown futures ahead of us. And, and she counted also the, the history of humanity and, and basically only the 19th century, finally, we, we, we realized that the future can be changed. That's not a predestination, like uh, with, that came with science and with other things. And although many people have said that, but in computer science, we always quote Alan Kay, the best way to predict the future is to invent it, right? So the question is, what things we can invent in the future to change uh, uh, to change the, the world? And I think this is, this is the dilemma today because we are, we are inventing things too fast without thinking what is the right invention. Mm -hmm. And we have another bias that we, when we talk about innovation, we think the innovation is something positive, but no, innovation even can be, can be wrong. Innovation sometimes is bad. Innovation only means it's new and it's positive yes. only if uh, we measure later what happened and we had uh, some uh, positive effects that are much larger than the negative effects. But we really don't know, for example, what will be the outcome of generative AI after three, four years. But but that's something I, I, I would like to see in the future. And I guess if we can change the future, we need to do something that is very hard for humans to do. We need to embrace uncertainty. We need to love uncertainty. We need to love to be surprised. Uh, maybe researchers like that. I, I love uncertainty. You know, not many people love it, even in life. Uh, I don't have any expectations usually. I, I prefer life to surprise me because typically if you have expectation, Murphy, only, I only believe in Murphy. Murphy will take care of that. And, and then your, your plan will go away. So I would like to see that, that maybe a new religion that is just embracing uncertainty and taking the control of our lives. Great. Um, Marijn, what do you see as the crystal ball? Crystal ball, well, we just had a question about the digital divide. Just ask it AI because they have a better answer than we have. Uh, uh, so the dream is, of course, to ensure that AI have correct answers, have good answers about it. If you ask about the crystal ball, about the future, the AI should be able to answer it. And that's a little bit what we uh, want and we are heading uh, for. But it's all about shaping. It's all about human control. It's all about using it uh, for the purpose. But don't think that AI is always right or is factual or something uh, like that. Huh? Don't put it on an amazing uh, level. Huh? It's just data-driven what we do now, probability uh, focused for that, considered as that. And I think we will be advanced, we will be advanced to fertile worlds. It will create new worlds for we where we can uh, live in, huh? like the beautiful pictures that are now created, you can create world three-dimensional uh, virtual worlds with that. You will be able to interact with the government in those uh, worlds uh, using the avatar uh, from the uh, government. Uh, you can look like uh, what, you're, uh, what you want to be uh, over there and you might be speaking, doing all kinds of funny things in those uh, virtual worlds. I think that's, that will be an uh, important uh, topic also for AI because there you can use the power of AI really for it, uh, uh, for that. And maybe for the more factual things where we need the real public services or participation and to avoid the fake news, maybe we should step down there a little bit, go to real explainable AI, look for other kind of AI mechanism than the data-driven uh, one, more the logical uh, one, more where you use ontologies as a basis uh, for that, knowledge graphs and those kind of things. And maybe they're more suitable for that. So maybe we get different streams of AI in practice that will really uh, help us. We keep on dreaming. 
Yeah, I just want to mention a caveat there because AI can predict the future, but it's using data from the past. Mm -hmm. So basically, at the end, we in some sense we are replicating the past. So, so what we need is how to can get new data from the future, and that's the only way to do it is by us, by humans. That AI cannot invent data that is outside this uh, huge bubble that is our current knowledge. Uh, um, uh, Stephen Wolfram once said in a, in a recent seminar, we invited him that that one of the power of AI is that AI can explore regions that we will never explore. For example, all possible combinations of a cat and a dog, and we will see things that we have never seen. But I think that's not enough because basically we are exploring the world that we know. I think what we need is to explore the world that we don't know. And of course, mm -hmm. we don't know what we know. And, and this, the AI will not find that world. So we need to find that world. Well, that by itself is a large conversation, the world that we don't know. And it's a great point to uh, end this conversation with. Uh, thank you both, uh, Ryan and Ricardo, for this uh, very thoughtful, insightful conversation. We appreciate that. And I'll turn it over to Georgette for the closure. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank our speakers um, and Sukumar. Um, this was a very interesting conversation. Uh, I don't know if I'm freaked out or if I'm hopeful. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so that, that, but that's where you want to be. There's, I'm, I'm excited about the possibilities of what could be done and that humans are still going to be needed. Um, but there, the, um, the potential for the for an irresponsible use of AI is still there, and we need to have those safeguards, um, especially when it comes to government's use of AI or oversight over AI, depending mm -hmm. on how you want to look at it. So um, I want to thank you all again. I want to thank all of the all of those of you who were able to log in. So I'm glad that you spent an hour with us. If you would like to share this video with your friends and have a wonderful um, conversation over cocktails or coffee or whatnot. This will be on our on Stig's YouTube channel as well as on our website later this afternoon. And if you have any questions, I'm sure the our guests do not mind you reaching out and um, sending an email. So thank you again, everyone, and I I look forward to seeing everyone again next month. Thank you.